Okay, so we're talking about language, and language, is, it's important to know how to deconstruct your own language, the way that you code and put information together. You know, we are talking about in class the, the various definitions of language. So we talked about denotative, connotative, we kind of hinted around language being culturally bound. But uh, one, a few of the points that I want to make today are um, have to do with furthering more about what we know about language. So language is um, it's symbolic, it has multiple meanings, uh, it informs our thoughts, and it's shaped by grammar and context. This is what we had on the board today. In uh, being symbolic, uh, for example, if I am telling you at the office to go and get a file folder, you know, uh, you know, you you have the picture in your mind what a file folder looks like, and you go and because you know what the symbol is for a file folder, um, you go and you get it. When I have a document at work that I want to file, and let's say, and my norm is I get a stack of documents, and in the stack of documents, I I put uh, like a symbol like this for myself. Hold on, just a moment. So let's say that here is my document. Up at the right hand corner, I will do an F slash U and then type uh, uh, right where I want that document to go. So if I want to, for example, have to file a lot in, uh, in Title IX, I have a lot of documents that I work with in Title IX. So I will put up in the right hand corner F slash U Title IX. Or I do a lot with Franklin Covey, so I will say, uh, F slash U uh, Franklin Covey. And then there are several different um, parts, different folders that I have in for Franklin Covey. So I'll put F slash U Franklin Covey, comma, assessment, just because I have to assess the program. So uh, our language is symbolic. We take all of these different symbols and we put them in a certain order so that we can send a message to someone so that we can pass information to someone. If people catch that information the way we want them to catch it, that meant they decoded our symbols in a way to get the message that we sent. In addition, as we talked about with the connotative meaning, language has multiple definitions in examples such as the clothing, in examples such as the music. Um, uh, music has different meanings for everyone. When, <laughs> an example is when I was growing up, uh, Elvis Presley was big, so I'm a big Elvis Presley fan. Also, Patsy Cline was kind of ending her reign of uh, being a star, a singing star, so I grew up with Patsy Cline as well. And so, you know, when we say the word music, you think of something maybe a way a lot different than what I would think about. In addition, uh, language informs our thoughts. We all use our own language, whatever we grew up with. I grew up out in the country, and I really did. This is no joke. I said things like wash, fix into, trying to think of the other slang that I used growing up. It was Texas country slang that I used and didn't really realize that until I moved to the big city and started working and socializing with people who weren't from Texas. So I remember the first time I used the word wash. Well, it didn't take me long to get that out of my vocabulary because I'd say, yeah, I got to go wash clothes. What? The other person was telling me, what did you just, I said, and I was in my 20s. 
just come into the big city. And I never felt so embarrassed uh, up till that point. Had many embarrassing moments since. But I realized that I was using slang and not everyone used that word outside of my country community. So our language has uh, informs our thoughts and our thoughts inform our language. Now the last um, kind of descriptor of language is that it, uh, it has grammar, it has syntax, and it has context. So let's take the let's take context first. For instance, if you have a Super Bowl party at your house and someone makes a touchdown, it's your team that makes a touchdown, you say, Woo! Touchdown! Woohoo! And you're all loud and everything. And then you go to a funeral because someone died. And do you say, Woo! A funeral! Ha ha! Well, no, you don't. Well, maybe you might, but I don't. The context is the funeral. Context dictates how we communicate. You communicate one way in the classroom. When you walk outside of that classroom, I hear y'all communicate a different way. In the classroom, I don't hear you all use very, too much, you know, curse language, but I hear you all out there in the hallway and you change it immediately. When you walk out into the hallway, you start using very vulgar language. And so the context in here is in the classroom. The context out there is actually, there's a real term for it. It's called hallway talk. And that's how you engage in hallway talk out there. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not scolding you. I'm just making a point. In addition to context and in context in the classroom communication, there are expectations for the way I think communication happens in the classroom and you have expectations as well. For instance, one of my biggest ex expectations and one of my biggest pet peeves in the classroom is uh, respect. And to me, you communicate you're a disrespectful person when you talk over people, when you are rude to people, when there are comments going around that are discriminative, that are racist, that are homophobic, uh, that are age-isms. When you communicate like that in my classroom, I think of you as a disrespectful person. When you talk during other classmates' presentations, to me, that's you are communicating to me that you're disrespectful because in my context of the classroom, my expectations for respectful communication are that you respect everyone in the classroom, no matter our differences, that cell phones and electronics are away and that you are not making fun of each other, whether it's um, language meant to hurt each other. Um, I pay attention and I listen when that language happens in classes and so for those folks who continually violate my expectations, and this is my context, my context is a classroom. For those students who continually violate my expectations for respectful communication in this classroom, when um, that student wants a little consideration for a late paper, for uh, 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 extra credit, for needing a favor, needing to not come to class, needing to take a test late, I'm not as inclined to. Uh, because of the disrespect that that person or persons are showing in the classroom. So language, okay, language is shaped by context. We change the way that we communicate. We change the language that we use and how we use it in coding based on the context, okay? Now then, let's talk about uh, language being shaped by grammar. You can't blame me. Okay, for wanting to teach you all grammar. 
because communication is you getting your voice heard in my classroom and in college classrooms across the nation if if students are not using grammar appropriately we do not hear your voice how can your voice be heard how can your voice be respected if you don't capitalize your eyes if you don't capitalize the letters of each for the first word first letter of each sentence if you don't put periods if you don't use commas now i know that we are not all perfect at grammar but the basics we all know because we are in a college classroom when you have sentences without the basics of grammar you've lost your voice if you don't want to have a voice don't use grammar don't capitalize don't want to have a voice in the workplace don't do any of that you don't want to be promoted then don't give them your voice and your voice would be to use appropriate grammar in writing I say that to you with all seriousness because I'm trying to teach you that it's not just the words in communicating communication is what you write and how you write it. Communication is what you say and how you say it. Communication is what you don't say. Communication is use on social media. Communication is your attire. Um, I want to give you an example. Uh, when I was uh, in uh, sophomore, uh, junior in college, I was taking a class. It was actually called Persuasion in Communication. And I was sent, it was in a, a theater type, and I sat about four rows up in the middle. I wanted to be, you know, make eye contact with the professor. So the first um, day, I didn't have my glasses. So I had, didn't have my glasses on. And so the professor just always kind of blurred over me. Then the next class session was a Monday Wednesday class. I remembered my glasses, so I put my glasses back on, sat in about the same spot, and I noticed she made dead on eye contact with me. So I thought, well, that's interesting. She didn't make this eye contact with me before. What did I do? What has changed? And so I thought, I wonder if it has anything to do with my glasses. I didn't have my glasses Monday. So I took my glasses off, and she blurred over me, put my glasses on, she stopped and made eye contact, and I wanted her making eye contact with me. And I found that very interesting because I was using language because I wanted to make a social connection with my professor, not only to give her respect, but to also try and do a better job at decoding her lectures so that I could understand them. So we come back here. Language is symbolic has multiple meanings, it, it informs our thoughts and is informed by our thoughts and is shaped by grammar and context. All right, so let's talk about um, how uh, co we have cognitive language. So let's write that on the board. So uh, cognitive language, cognitive language. So when you think about cognitive language and you think about what that means, it's just it's language um, that we use to, to 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 put this system of symbols together. So um, I if I am trying to tell you, okay, that as a matter of fact, if I say Wednesday we will have a test over chapter three. Okay, I say chapter three. But be sure that when you come to class Wednesday, you have read chapter four. So what I did was I used some symbols. I used the language of the word three and the nonverbal three to reinforce so that you could hear and see and process that the test that we will have Wednesday is chapter 3 and we will lecture over chapter 4. 
because I want to make sure that you decode that message appropriately. So we use a lot of cognition in processing that information. So let's talk about communication acquisition. And communication acquisition is, I'm going to write this down, communication acquisition. How do we acquire the language? How do we come to learn these words? Think about what story do your parents tell you about the first word that you said? And what was the first word? You know, our mothers want us to say what? <laughs> Mama, mother, mommy, mum, you know, something. I'm going to be all proud. Oh, my, my baby said mama yesterday, and, and she's only three months old, you know, something like that. It's going to make them all proud. We learn our language through our parents, through those people who raise us. And, um, we, we acquire words, and then once we acquire words, we acquire uh, thoughts, and we start putting sentences together with these learn with these words that we keep hearing. Uh, we learn meanings of words. I remember when I was, I guess I had to be about. 14 years old and my youngest brother I think was about four four or five and we used to have Sunday dinners at the table we either had roast or uh, uh, chicken fried steak it was always one of the two and so we sat down at the table and my little brother had on his green little shorts with his dingo boots and swinging his legs and he's eating and we drank really sweet tea at the time. So he starts drinking tea and eating his roast and all of a sudden he says, it's, it's, it's not like it's a great big announcement, but loud enough I was sitting beside him so I could hear it. And he said, I gotta go take a shit. And oh my gosh, I I turned around. And I said, Joe David, what did you say? And and he was headed, you know, to the bathroom. So I said, Mom, did you hear what Joe David said? She said, Well, no, I didn't hear what Joe David said. I was the only one who heard what he said. And and he's and and so I repeated to Mom. Of course, then I got in trouble for repeating it. But anyway, um, he learned the word shit and used it the way he thought he was supposed to use it but you know hadn't learned the etiquette around that whole concept of excusing yourself to go to the bathroom he hadn't gotten the politeness down yet may I be excused from the table type of so he learned it from somewhere we still tease him about that story we just did it the other couple of weeks ago bless his heart we don't let him forget it and um he has since learned how to use it appropriately and in context he has three kids of his own so he's l learning that that whole uh proper etiquette uh, his kids have to ask to be excused to to leave the table so uh well, let's move from cognitive language and communication acquisition to culturally bound, specifically. Um, and I say that because when we talk about culture, culture dictates how we communicate. So, for instance, um, I grew up in a, in a Mexican culture, and, and in my culture, um, one of the ways that we communicate is that um, if if I'm in a room and I was a child, uh, when I was in a room with adults, I didn't speak. And I always said in, in Spanish, yes ma'am, no ma'am, mande is what we would always say. Uh, you know, if your mom, your grandmother, or an aunt, you would say mande, you know. And um, if we didn't, we were whoosh, publicly scolded. And that's culture. So right now, if my aunt were to walk in here, I have an Aunt Olivia, and if she walked in here 
and uh, my family calls me Di and said Di and she said something I would say Monday but in here Monday um, so that's how we show respect to our elders and it's culturally bound so that dictates how we communicate with other people okay so we've talked about uh, cognitive language um, cognitive acquisition let's talk a little bit about the the communication accommodation theory it's called cat communication accommodation theory communication accommodation theory says that I change the way I encode a message based upon the the context so it, let's take for example you go out with your friends on a Friday night you would use uh, communication accommodation theory to change that message based on the person you're talking to so let's say that you are going to tell your best friend about this date that you had Friday night and it's Saturday morning so you send your friend that message one way you give them all the juicy little details and the things you really liked about that date and liked about that other person then your parents or the people who are raising you ask you how was your date last night well you're gonna give them all those juicy details are you gonna tell them exactly what you told your best friend <laughs> I didn't know then you go to church if you happen to go to church and your priest or your preacher or the head person says hey I heard you had a date last night tell me about it how are you going to change the message okay so it's not only uh, communication accommodation theory isn't only about changing the symbols that you put together to send out to that other person but it's also a dialect that we use for instance in my dialect I might if I'm if I go back to where I'm from out in the country I and we all do it we revert back to the way we communicate so I slow my rate of speech at which I speak I incorporate more of the language back like wash you know how y'all doing you know and uh, because I am with my people my country people and so when I come back here in the classroom I pick up the rate of speed at which I speak I don't use the word wash I try not to say thing words like gonna because I don't believe that's a word in the dictionary I've been working hard to get that out of my language repertoire and so the competent communicator will engage in, in communication accommodation theory they recognize you know what I am in the workplace so I need to capitalize my eyes I need to put periods at the end of each sentence and I need to capitalize the first word of every sentence versus hey I'm home I'm texting my significant other I don't need to capitalize because I'm using communication accommodation theory competent communicator understands in the classroom you have to change the way you communicate in at work with friends depending upon the context okay so um, all of those aspects are important to know about communication alright so we have I think talked about the majority of the chapter and so I think that that's about it culturally bound, there's meaning, there's context, and I'm just taking a quick look. I think that that pretty much has it. There might be a couple of concepts in there that I didn't cover. George Bernard Shaw 
is we actually refer to him as the father of our discipline because he studied communication and just really laid the foundation for communication as a field. And he said, he had this to say about communication. Bernard, uh, uh, George Bernard Shaw says the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. I want you to think about that in the context of this chapter because this will be your discussion question on your test. Okay. Thank you.